Um, can people see my screen? Yes, yes. we can. It's a, and it's full full screen, so it's great. Great, thank you so much. Scott. Okay, so I'll be talking about some of the recent work, and actually, I would love to come back sometime and talk also about another half of my research that is working on friendship paradoxes and networks, which is also a very fun topic to talk about. Okay, but today I'll be talking about bias and data and computational social science in general. And as data scientists, you know, we have many questions about human behavior. And to answer those questions, we collect data. So, for example, you have a question such as, does obesity shorten lives? And, you know, you go out, find data sources. You put them, for example, here. Um, uh, here we have, for example, you measure life expectancy, suppose, at the level of countries, microscopic level, versus the obesity rate in the population. And this is what social data, all social data looks like this. It looks like a cloud. Some of it looks more like a cloud than others, you know, but uh, this is fairly typical. And as social scientists, then we apply different models, for example, linear models, regression analysis, and so forth, um, to identify trends within the population. So this type, when you, if you analyze this data, you see if you, especially if you, you know, sometimes it helps to squint your eyes when you look at social data, but you'll see this overall, this positive trend. Which means, what does it mean? It means that as obesity rate in the population increases, people live longer in those countries. So this is a curious finding. What's going on here? Is it, is it right? Or uh, what's going on here is that usually social data that generates clouds like this is highly heterogeneous. It's, it's composed of different types of countries. For example, some countries are rich and some countries are poor. And if you take the same data and then you disaggregate it, for example, by the GDP of the country, uh, split data by income, then you, uh, the trends you're going to observe completely change. And in fact, for, for example, for high income con uh, countries, you see that uh, obesity rate is actually negatively correlated with uh, life expectancy. So the, the more obese the population becomes, the shorter the lifespan, uh, which makes more sense. And, and But for low income countries, for example, you still see the same um, positive trend. And in fact, you know, this trend, the, the, the trend I saw for the poor high income countries, actually, then you, you know, the question is, should you trust the trend or not? But you should trust the trend because when you look in the level within the country and then this, uh, like US, and then you disaggregate by different uh, states, you, you, you also observe the same type of um, negative trend within states and the states are more homogeneous, smaller populations that namely the higher the obesity rate within the population, the shorter the lifespan of the individuals. So this is in general, uh, the kind of illustrates the challenges that social scientists uh, face with the data. And I will, I'm going to be talking about, you know, the things that creates these challenges. And this is the biases in data. And I'll show you uh, why biases in data cannot be ignored because they uh, offer threats to predictions of the validity of the inferences you make from the data. Which, uh, and these threats come at three different levels. They are threats to predictions, biases in data that you know, confuse or obfuscate the actual relationships that you are trying to measure from data. They lead to non-generalizable, non-reproducible models, especially for computer scientists that want to build predictive models. And that result in poor performance and held out data. For more for social scientists, uh, these types of biases in data pose threats to explanations. You know, social scientists want to learn about individual behavior from uh, looking at population level data, but this often presents things like ecological fallacy. Uh, and I'll show you the biases in data cause are the reason for ecological fallacy to occur. You cannot learn about individual behavior from population level behaviors. And they can lead to wrong inferences about, well, so which means they, they lead to wrong inferences about uh, individual behavior, which for policymakers uh, results in uh, uh, threats to uh, what kind of interventions people can design from, uh, from, from those. So social scientists and policymakers hope to learn from data in order to guide, uh, motivate what kind of interventions they want to introduce to uh, change people's behavior. And an additional threat that hopefully I have time to get to is that 
biases and that, of course, uh, stress to the fairness of algorithms. Uh, models learned from biased data may actually entrench and amplify existing discrimination. So that's an additional threat uh, to the biases. So Rafa and I talk will, will follow this outline. Of course, I'll discuss a variety of sources of bias in data, focusing on Simpson's paradox, which actually got me started in this uh, area. Then I'll talk about uh, methods that we have developed in my group to debias data, to identify latent confounders, or observed confounders, latent confounders. And then I'll talk about some of the more recent work on algorithmic fairness that has captured much of the Im imagination of the com computer science community. Okay, so I will, unfortunately, won't have time to cover all of these, but there's a, a lot of so, uh, a variety of sources and bias and data that will obfuscate the trends that you, the relationships you're trying to learn. I'll probably spend more most of my time on Simpson's paradox and survivor bias and aggregation bias, but we have also done some work in filtering bias with showing how when you sample data, if you don't observe all the data, but even the random samples of the data, it actually may distort the trends uh, and the relationships you observe from the data, and also longitudinal data fallacy. Many people actually learn measuring data, well, a um, lot of research looking at, for, especially for temporal behavior, social behavior, um, looking within longitudinal versus cross-sectional analysis, and this can give very good, different results. But that's maybe I'll talk about some other time, probably not today. I'll spend most of my time on these four different paradoxes. My favorite one, Simpson's paradox. I'm not, not sure if, if I could see the audience now would ask you if, how many of you have heard of Simpson's paradox. I certainly hadn't until a uh, few years ago when I started studying it, but it's actually been around for a long time, it's known for a long time, since the 1950s. And Simpson's paradox simply says that a trend that appears in data at population level will disappear or even reverse when you disaggregate data into different subgroups. So as I said before, like if you, um, if you look all social data, which is the gray dots here, it looks like a diffuse cloud. This is synthetic data, so you can see the groups uh, more easily, but in general, the data look, uh, social data looks like a cloud. And if you squint your eyes, you might see a positive trend in this data, but because there's different subgroups, each with its different behaviors, like the countries in different economic brackets here, uh, the subgroups might actually, uh, the trends within subgroups might actually look completely different from the trend in the population as a whole. So that's Simpson's paradox. And it's a basis for many, many different things that have misled scientists for a long time and other people. So here I'm illustrating with quite a famous um, example of Simpson's paradox, which I think actually ends up in the US Supreme Court as a study where um, showing that Simpson's paradox can have real effects in the real world as well. So this was a case that was uh, where a University of UC Berkeley was, uh, University of California at Berkeley was sued for discrimination against women. And why? The evidence was that of the applicants who admitted for graduate study, 43% of the men applicant, male applicants were admitted compared to 35% of women. So the plaintiffs argued that this was an evidence of discrimination bias against women. But is there bias against women or not? So if you take the same data that was used to compute these numbers, and now you disaggregate, you split the data by department to see how many, within each department, how many applicants were admitted. And you see quite different picture. And actually this, in most of the departments, women at least have parity in admission. So the, the bars show the percent of female, in bars are percent of female applicants admitted into uh, programs versus males. And within each department, you know, women actually have often have a higher chance of being admitted, and yet overall they have a lower chance of being admitted. Why is that? Well, you know, these departments are high, very different. You know, some departments have are easier to get to, and some are very difficult to get to. And it happens to be that women, more women apply to these departments, which are more difficult for applicants of either gender to get into than these departments that are easier for applicants of either, both genders to get into. So these departments that are hard to get into tend to be humanities, English, the kind of the yeah, um, departments that are typically more women apply to. 
and the easier departments are like the STEM, the science and engineering departments, the um, fewer women apply to these departments, but they're easy overlooked overall uh, for applicants and everything. And this, so does bias exist? Yes, the bias exists because in the educational system that ch channels the women throughout their educational career to choose departments, uh, to choose to study things like history and English, which are um, you know, very hard in, to, to, get to get into graduate studies programs. So this is the level at which bias exists, not in the, at the level of how, what fraction of applicants are admitted. Okay, so Simpson's paradox. Um, Simpson's paradox can also lead to sampling bias, which I think could also explain some of the non-reproducibility of psychological studies. Imagine you had one study where you were measuring some outcome versus some you know, independent variables like X, whatever it is. And you so you have one study and you sampled the, the subgroups and you measured an overall positive trend. This is a red line in the dark. Suppose next time another group conducted the study and they recruited participants, but they, they did not know about the underlying subgroups. So they oversampled one of the subgroups. Well, oversampling one of the subgroups will completely distort the linear models that people are analyzing to measure the trends. So even though the underlying behaviors haven't changed, the green line, for example, the green subgroup, the underlying be, uh, behaviors, the trends of the outcome variable versus the independent variable, they stayed the same. The fact that you oversampled one of the subgroups, had more points for it, would completely distort the linear model you learned on the population as a whole. Okay, so, um, oh, another one of really my favorite, one of my favorite examples of Simpson's paradox related, but this is called survivor bias, um, is actually, um, maybe I should illustrate it here with a slide. Um, survivor bias, because your results, your trends you learned might change because your population your measuring the trend over is changing as a function of the independent variable. So suppose you have, um, this is actually an example, it comes from one of my favorite papers, which was written quite a few years ago, but it has many, many examples of these types of surprising effects you get when you uh, look at data, population level data. Suppose you're measuring recidivism rate. So uh, the rate at which convicts, they serve time in prison, they're released from prison, and then you observe how many of them commit another crime and re, uh, return to uh, prison, are arrested again. So this is called recidivism rate, starting from the time that they're re released from prison. So population level, and this is many studies have been done of this, it looks like population level looks like recidivism, recidivism rate declines over time. Fewer and fewer fraction of convicts return to jail the longer it's been since the time they've been released. And then, you know, you you formulate theories, hypothesis, saying, okay, well, as people age, they become more, you know, they become less likely to commit a crime. They become better citizens as they, with age. And this might seem perfectly reasonable, but underneath something completely different is going on. So in reality, there's two subgroups within the population. Let's call them incorrigibles. You know, they will never be, uh, once they're released, they, will, then they did not learn their lesson. They will commit another crime at some high rate and, and, and return to prison. And they're the reformed. You know, they're, they learn their lesson. They're good, they'll become good members of society. Once they're released, you know, they will commit a, another crime at a very, very small, uh, low rate. And so, so what happens actually over time? Well, over time, you start losing more and more people from this population, from the incorrigibles. There's fewer of them. And as a result, the average for the entire population starts going down, as you see this in left and uh, shown. So this might look like a, a, a cartoon type of example, but it really happens in, in, in data analysis. So I'm illustrating this for the studies on social media, which is simply looking at the spread of information and one of the fundamental quantities you want to learn, uh, you want to measure in, when you're uh, studying the spread information is what is the probability that you're going to share some piece of information given some of your friends, X number of your friends have uh, shared it. So for example, this is from the study by Romero et al, including John Kleinberg, looking at what is the probability you're going to use some, talk about some topic, use the hashtag associated with the topic given X of your friends have actually tweeted about this topic or used this particular hashtag. And they, um, 
wrote a paper that studies shows that the more of your friends use the hashtag, the more likely you are to use it. So the probability goes up. But until a certain point, it's kind of saturated just its peak, and then the more friends you use it, it looks like you know they kind of suppress your response. So the more friends use talk about a particular topic, the less likely you are to to use it. And the whole paper then was about uh, for different topics showing where the peak occurs and how quickly it decays. Okay, but this is an example of survival bias. Uh, what's going on and underneath is the speculation of Twitter users who are using these hashtags. They're very, very different. Some of them have few friends, follow few people, and so when they go to come to Twitter, they see very short news feeds, only a few new tweet, uh, tweets in their timeline. And some of them follow many, many, many people, you know, hundreds or maybe even thousands of people. So each time they come to Twitter, they will see a very long timeline, many, many new tweets formed. Um, so these people who follow many others, there's, it's, it's very highly unlikely they will see any specific topic or any specific hashtag. And even though they're, they're more likely, you know, they, but their response actually goes up, uh, the more friends tweet, the more likely they're going to use, uh, tweet about the same topic. This holds true for people who follow many others and also for people who follow a few friends. But in both cases, for both these subgroups, the responses monotonically increases with the number of tweeting friends. And yet, as you start looking population level trend, you, you combine data from both these groups. So in the beginning, everybody contributes. So you're, if you're studying response population as a whole, at first it will start going, your probability to retweet something, what your friends are talking about will go up. But then these people who follow a few others, they'll start dropping out of your population level averages. And the whole your response overall will will turn over and uh, uh, start going down. Not because your, you know, friends respond, friends tweeting inhibits your response, but simply because the population is changing as you're trying to measure response over uh, the exposure. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. But this is an example of survival bias, and you know it will pollute the results of your analysis, the conclusions you're drawing. What else can happen in reality, uh, in, in, in data? Well, one of these, th this has been known by people who studied GIS, geographical information system for, for a long time. This is called modifiable aerial unit problem. Uh, it's a statistical bias that the results when the data uh, is aggregated at different spatial resolutions. Whatever estimates you're measuring depend on how you're defining the area where you're measuring. And we recently showed that it also affects measurements of, you know, how other types of measurements, temporal measurements as well. So we looked at simply looked at uh, um, how quickly COVID uh, infection rates are rising in different levels, and um, so and showed that the aggregation bias can distort the measured COVID rates. So this is an illustration of example. So you're looking, actually this is during the first search for data from uh, January through April in United States. So if you look at specifically for New York State, New York State, uh, New York State is composed of different counties within each state, each of which is measuring, each county has its own health department, they're measuring how quickly COVID is rising. So each of these dashed lines actually representing different counties, different regions within New York State. Um, and we can actually estimate the growth rate, you know, by fitting an exponential using negative binomial to fit a model to estimate how quickly infections are rising in each state. And then aggregating all the counties within New York State, you aggregate them into combined the New York State case numbers, and then you can do the same thing to estimate how quickly the cases are rising in New York State as a whole. Um, and actually, aggregation biases observed. Growth, rate, growth rates, because if you look at now distribution all over the United States, look at distribution of growth rates, COVID growth rates within counties, you're going to get, and then aggregate data, county data into states, you measure the growth rate for states, the growth rates for states will be systematically higher than at the level of counties. And the growth rate for US as a whole, country as a whole, will still be higher than um, average growth rate in states and also average growth rate in counties. And I can give another talk about why it's happening, but this is just to illustrate that aggregation bias, combining 
subpopulations, measuring rates within subpopulations and combining them to, to measure rates at the population as a whole can give you different results. Oh, also just to show this is happening at different resolution levels. If you look within county, different neighborhoods, for this is for Los Angeles County where, where I live. For a long time, we had many, many problems actually with COVID, quite severe problems. So, but the same aggregation bias is happening at the uh, smaller uh, resolution. So if you look at growth rates within individual neighborhoods and then combine it for Los Angeles County or Los Angeles City as a whole, you actually get also that uh, looks like COVID is spreading much faster in the county as a whole than it is within individual neighborhoods. Okay, so this was kind of a whirlwind of some of the biases that occur in data analysis. But what do you actually do about this? How can you actually figure out when uh, biases are at, uh, these, something, a bias is taking place in the data and how to, uh, how to correct for it automatically? So we've, we've figured this out only for sub, sub, subset of biases, we're talking about uh, Simpsons paradox, but uh, we have developed method and it's actually available online for people to try a method that automatically identifies when Simpsons paradox exists in the data by systematically disaggregating data into individual more homogeneous subgroups and looking at functional differences between the subgroups and the pooled data. And actually, it has led to some insights into data and about behavior within populations that I will talk about. So this method is actually quite simple. Uh, it just takes, a, you provide it with the tabular data. And I think this code that uh, is uh, shown here is actually works for binary outcomes, but it can be expanded uh, to continuous outcomes as well. So you, you, pr you give it the tabular data with some outcome you're interested in measuring and, uh, and, and many different independent variables or covariates x. And then it measures the outcome, it's like a population level model. So outcome versus one of the covariates. And then it simply takes, in turn, it takes each other variable and it dis disaggregates the data according to that another covariate. And there is some magic, of course, that occurs in about how you disaggregate data, how best to disaggregate data, and details are uh, described in the papers there. Um, but then once you disaggregate data, and then you can look for the same trends you're measuring here, you can look for these trends within each bin, within each disaggregated bin, uh, and see how many of those trends reverse. And you can do it systematically for all the features within your data set. Um, it's a quite simple method. We applied it to a variety of data sets and we've actually identified some interesting behaviors. One of my favorite one is actually this uh, evidence for cognitive depletion. So this was once uh, we kind of saw these effects and I started investigating lit literature and there's a body of work from Roy Baumeister's group talking about ego depletion. So ego depletion, uh, psychology, uh, ego depletion psychology means like when you Exert mental effort, exerting mental effort is costly. Like mental effort is like uh, self-control is like a muscle. As you use it, it gets tired. So if you exert mental effort, for example, solving difficult math problems, making difficult decisions, um, doing hard mental work, it leaves less energy for you to do more mental work accurately or to exercise self-control. So if you ask people to do hard math problems for a long time, they'll be less likely to resist urges, like resist chocolate cake when offered it. And this is, is this theory is used to explain many um, social phenomena uh, that people basically get worse with time after exerting mental effort. And we see this kind of behavior also online where we actually look at the, uh, the more people do stuff online, the worse their performance becomes. So looking at Stack Overflow data, we're looking at People, you know, what is the quality of the answers people provide to questions that other people ask? Um, look, the longer, so th this data on, on the right uh, is showing actually in the in over course of a sessions, people, for example, come to Stack Overflow, start answering questions. Suppose they answer five questions. The first question is better than the second. Their sec the first answer they write to, to some question is better than the second answer they provide. You know, the answer to some other question, and then there's the answer to the third, you know, another question. And each answer they write gets progressively worse and worse 
meaning he gets less likely to be accepted as a, as a good answer. Um, kind of similar type. So the more they do the work they do, the, the worse their work becomes. And people who write, for example, only two answers, you know, the first answer is better, more likely to be accepted than, than the second answer. But we would not have seen it unless we disaggregated data by the length of the session. Here the, on the left is showing on the population level and population as a whole looks like the answers, subsequent answers get better and better. They're more likely to be accepted as best answer by the, by the question asker. So why is this happening? And then exactly for the same reasons as I was showing before, most of the time, like this, uh, most of the data is in uh, people who only write by answer one question and then they leave. Right? That's like a lot, most of the data is here. Then next most common is people who write answer two questions. They probably write two answers. And people who write, the more answers people write, kind of the better they are. But within each population, you know, people who are able to provide more answers, this, uh, the behavior still, you know, the uh, um, quality of the answer still declines over time due to things like ease of repetition. So this happens in Stack Overflow. Rather the same thing, people who write um, more, uh, answer more, uh, looking in Reddit data, we also can look at people who write uh, comments, like they comment on posts, that each subsequent comment becomes shorter, receives fewer upvotes, receives fewer responses, and has lower readability, becomes harder to read. So this is uh, the same kind of ego depletion work that's going on in uh, online work. Um, and you know, there's many other examples of this type of behavior we've seen, but uh, also confirming that uh, people get worse as they answer. So um, the more the more effort they spend online. So actually, I have uh, looking at the time right now. Uh, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to talk about some uh, algorithmic as uh, fairness aspects of this. So showing this um, biases in data inherent things that correlate variables the, the, the effect population level trends but now we have algorithms that learn, learn from those traits and then those algorithms are used to make predictions about human behavior so are those predictions actually fair or though are they polluted by bi biases to create discrimination so this is a very hot topic right now and i know you've gotten, done some work in this as well uh, all touching upon ethics of ai and algorithms so some of this will be familiar to you, but I'll talk about some of the more alg algorithmic or more com uh, computer science aspects of it. But first, basically, what does it mean to be fair? You know, so there's still lots of uh, controversy, not controversy, but lots of discussions about how to measure fairness and many different measures of fairness. But all of us have some notions about what intuitive properties of fairness should should be. You know, so fair to be fair by the algorithm for a human being, you know, means that you're private attributes such as race, gender, you know, what you think about life and you know, well-being, so your private personality, they should not affect how you're treated by other people or by the algorithm, you know, especially when those private attributes are not relevant to the task or the decision uh, that is being made. Yeah, but, you know, so that's kind of easy for us to agree on. What's less easy to agree on is how to measure this and there's dozens of measures of fairness i'm going to talk about some of them a few of them and also many of these measures of fairness are incompatible with it with each other or or can only apply simultaneously to be satisfied in a few special cases and that's the fascinating part that many computer scientists are right now looking at um so this topic of algorithmic fairness really you know even though people have been studying it before it really burst into this seen when uh, pro in, in a ProPublica study of evaluation, evaluating this tool called Compass tool that has been used by judges to evaluate risk scores of uh, individuals. So uh, given people like criminals or the defendants, they come before a judge and then judge runs this tool on their attributes and it gives the risk score. Uh, and then using this risk score, this is a risk score, it gives the probability a person will commit a crime. And then based on this probability, uh, the judge will decide whether the person should go be granted parole, you know, be released from jail or stay in jail or what kind of uh, service the person needs to do. So lots of high stakes decisions are being made based on this uh, predicted probability of recidivism, predicted probability of committing crime. Um, so 
you can look at what this predicted probability and the compass tool actually was aware and the people who made compass they were aware of the different potential for biases to creep in so they calibrated their tool a lot so the prediction as i said before the prediction basically gives you the probability of committing another crime so people who are given a risk score of one for example and you can look at the population of people who are given a risk score of one and in uh, about 10 percent of these people should commit crime in the future let's say within two next two years 10 percent of these people will commit a crime now people who are given a higher risk score like risk score of six for example if you look over the next two years 60 percent of them will commit another crime so that's and and compass was calibrated so it, this probability of committing crime given your risk score should be the same whether you're black or white and there's you know societal be benefits to collaboration this notion of fairness should be the same you know given your individual attributes like your be your race for example should not affect uh your your risk score you know what your probability of committing crime so compass was calibrated to give uh, this this kind of objectively measurable um, rate uh, score that took, that links to the probability that that person of that type of person is going to commit a crime. Well, how well does it work? So what ProPublica did was actually take actual data about seven thousand people who were arrested and uh, arrested for crimes in, over this period, and then they looked going forward. They looked how many of those people committed a crime over the next two years time. And then as you know, computer scientists can write the uh, confusion matrix to measure uh, how well the algorithm worked. So you can look at actually the predictions it made. So you, so it gave, for example, a low risk score, which means a person will not commit a crime, or it, uh, it gives a high risk score saying a person will commit a crime. And then you look at what actually happened. Did the person commit a crime or did not commit the crime? And you get this confusion matrix with uh, true positives, the mean predictions that were correct and you get false positive predictions that were not correct and so forth were made. and you can see how these mistakes that the algorithm is making that are off the diagonal elements actually how they are distributed among different racial groups and what you found actually uh, is is this disparity uh, according to race so if you look at at risk score and you look at the um, probability you know defendants are given those risk scores defendants who did not who had committed crime so these are the positive cases so people who within the two years they committed another crime you can look at what risk scores they they they, they were given and you can see actually whites are systematically get more of them given low scores than blacks and blacks are given systematically higher um, but whites are considered uh, even though they commit another crime in the future they were committed to be they were systematically evaluated as being low risk by the algorithm and the situation flips if you look at people who never committed another crime. So among the people who were not going to commit another crime in the future, blacks, which is the blue bars, they were given, more of them were given systematically higher risk scores. The algorithm considered them to be more dangerous than they actually were in reality. So what is going on here? So actually this is two ways of measuring fairness, like you see, you see um, conditioned on predictions conditioned on risk scores the outcomes to be for an algorithm to be fair the al al uh, outcome should not depend on race this is the calibration property of the of uh, fairness that compass was optimizing for so compass tool is fair if you look at probability of recidivism given a risk score it's more or less the same for the two for the two races for the whites and the blacks but there is another condition for fairness, the balance condition. So conditioned on outcomes, you should also, to be fair, also can mean that conditioned on outcomes, whether or not you commit a crime. Prediction should not depend on race. And here there was a disparity. Compass uh, tool was given a disparity between these, um, between the races. And this was actually uh, shown, not shown until, realized until the paper by Kleinberg, Mill, Nathan, Ragland, that these two, um, Two fairness conditions, calibration and balance, cannot be simultaneously satisfied, except for special cases, such as perfect prediction. If you had an oracle who can, for each person, could exactly predict this, then differences wouldn't matter, and you would have, you would make no mistakes. There would be no orthogonal elements, and you would have perfect predict. Uh, there would be no unfairness. 
or in other special cases when you have equal base rates, when you, the, the rate at which the two populations are uh, committing crimes is the same, there's no difference between the populations, so you'll get different, uh, you'll get the same predictions and they'll be, both will be fair. But unless those are, uh, those, uh, those are pretty hard conditions to satisfy, and in other, other cases you will get this, uh, in, uh, you'll get this two different conditions which you cannot satisfy. So there's another um, impact of fairness, actually. It turns out that fairness also impacts when you make algorithms more fair, you reduce their accuracy. Um, and, and accuracy actually, for algorithmic predictions, the accuracy matters. If you make a mistake, it has real consequences. Uh, if, you make, if the algorithm makes mistakes, it has human uh, consequences. Suppose algorithms makes false negatives. It's basically saying, false negatives says the defendant will not commit a crime, so the judge will release go out, but actually it's a defendant is actually a criminal and it will it will commit crime. So if you false negatives will lead to an increase in, in crime. So there's a social cost to making uh, false negatives. But there's also a social cost to making false positives. If the algorithm algorithm says the defendant will commit a crime, but in reality the defendant is low risk. So Detaining a low-risk defendant will actually disrupt their life, disrupt their family's life, and will create a, a, a real cost. So both of these mistakes actually carry social costs. Either you're having overall increase in crime if you're releasing violent offenders, or you're uh, having huge uh, personal and uh, individual cost on, by detaining low-risk offenders. So. This is another paper, uh, seminal paper that came out showing that fairness actually uh, and accuracy uh, can be quite uh, correlated. You cannot uh, have high, whenever you make algorithms more fair, we will actually reduce their accuracy. Okay, so this is the background. And I just like to, so people have been trying to solve these problems for the last five years or so, trying to create algorithms that are more fair and also more accurate so they can actually balance in the, the trade-offs they can reduce the balance the trade-offs to improve fairness and also improve accuracy and there's a number of approaches there's a, uh, but i'd like to show talk about this one that we wrote about it is very very simple easy to explain uh, and it actually show you the performance quite well so um given some data you have again thing uh, data as i was talking before you have some tabular data you have an outcome and uh, some features and some of these features we're going to uh, called uh, covariates, we're going to call them sensitive features. They're going to be um, things like race or gender that you want your algorithm to make fair predictions with respect to those fair features. And the algorithm is quite simple. It uses just linear algebra to make, uh, to create uh, models. So you have, you can think of these features as being some sort of vectors in the highly dim dimensional space, data space. And some of those features, as I said, like let's call them XP, they're sensitive features. Um, uh, so you just then what our, our product method does is actually to, it finds uses linear algebra, like orthogonalization, to find the null space that's perpendicular, orthogonal to these fair features. Could be one feature, could be a combination of features. Okay, so it finds the null space and then it projects remaining covariates into this null space. So by design, any projected variables are going to be orthogonal, meaning they're going to be linear, linearly independent with these uh, sensitive features. And then we actually can introduce parameter lambda that adjusts the level of fairness. So it adjusts how much you're using, uh, whether you're using original uh, feature or it's projected one. So lambda will measure, measure the balance between original and projected features. And then, but then, um, you can use these uh, projected features, we call them fair features, uh, in any of the model, in in variety of different models. So there's the, the original feature, um, this fair features actually they retain their interpretability. So they're just projected ver uh, versions of the original features. But then you can use them within regression models. You can reuse them within decision trees, random forest, uh, SVM neural networks, any of the computer science algorithms that you like. And I'll show you that actually the using these projected or linearly independent features, features that are linearly independent of the sensitive variables, they actually make 
fair predictions and more accurate than other state-of-the-art methods. So I'm going again, we demonstrated it in a variety of algorithms, but I'm coming back to uh, comp compass. Um, and here actually I'm looking, uh, uh, you know, one of the trade-offs was uh, this uh, trade-offs between accuracy, uh, accuracy and fairness. So here I'm measuring fairness by correlation between predictions, predictive predictions the algorithm making and protected features. So how much information about protected features here, it's race. How much information about race is your prediction, your algorithmic prediction revealing? So you're measuring uh, just simply as a correlation between, which is another accepted method to measure fairness through a correlation between outcome, uh, predicted outcome and protected features versus the accuracy of the algorithm. And again, actually there's, you see uh, each of these symbols showing different algorithm and you see this overall uh, positive trend, which is showing the trade-offs. So as you make algorithms more accurate, going to the right, the correlation increases, meaning uh, the predictions are revealing more about sensitive attributes, hence they're less fair. So this is the overall trade-off. And these different methods actually, like for example, the, this Zafar is a, one of the first papers that were written actually show it's using some, um, they just use linear models like regression, they added some loss function related to uh, unfairness to, to try to optimize, make more fair predictions, you know, reducing uh, more, uh, make predictions by minimizing the loss function uh, due to unfairness. So this is their algorithm. And here actually are predictions using different models from uh, using different models that use our projected variables this, uh, into this linear localization. And you can see these, our, um, these models actually give you much higher accuracy for the same level of fairness. So if you look at the given level of unfairness, and our models give much higher accuracy. Uh, or for given accuracy, actually, our models give much better fairness. So if you fix uh, to the accuracy, our models give predictions that actually can be quite fair as opposed to other methods that, uh, that leak a lot of information about the protected features. Um, this is one, here's another way of looking at the balance and calibration uh, conditions. Uh, we can measure balance as the uh, difference between the means. Like, so uh, as I was showing before, so here, here we have different distributions. So we can actually look at the means for the two distribu for the distributions of the uh, risk score for the two classes, and we look at the difference between those means that, that defines the balance condition, both for the uh, uh, positive class and the negative class. And look at calibration error uh, is also looking at the difference between those two calibra uh, uh, calibration conditions. So, um, and again, here also the the, the negatives trend, all these algorithm predictions, uh, they have negative trend, meaning that there's the trade-offs between there. As you make, as you reduce the calibration error, going to the left, you actually becomes uh, more unbalanced, uh, the predictions. Uh, so you cannot satisfy both at the same time. But our, our models, which are these, um, the red and blue curves actually, give you much better uh, fairness conditions. So they actually reduce the balance for given calibration error, for given calibration error, for, for example, we have much lower balance, less, less difference between the two different, uh, the distributions for the two different races. And for the same balance, actually we can get much lower calibration error. So the, the predictions will be more calibrated and, and make fewer uh, errors about the, um, the, the races. Okay, so, so, so showing even though trade-offs exist, you can actually construct algorithms that give you much better um, conditions on the on those uh, on those trade-offs than other methods can do. So you can have more accurate and more fairer predictions than alternative methods. Okay, so I think I tried to uh, fit everything into this building uh, introduction about the course. So, in summary. And show you that biases, the, the underlying, the heterogeneity within the data that introduce, introduces correlations between different features and the outcome that you're observing, it offers threats to predictions and to 
improve the approach actually to improve to reduce some of those uh, impact of the biases we can actually use um, methods like identifying Simpson's paradox to identify these more homogeneous subgroups within the population and construct models uh, with respect to those subgroups and it will improve the gen generalizability of the models and make them work better uh, in making predictions for held out data. We can also look at this, uh, identify these subgroups in data and then uh, create better explanations for the underlying behaviors, which will guide better intervention, uh, intervention policies. And then we can also devise data either by identifying Simpson's paradox and actually a, a method, a linear orthogonalization method actually was motivated by Simpson's paradoxes. It, it's uh, basically we wanted to find uh, features that will not create Simpson's paradox in analysis. So this is what we do by devising the data to identify um, underlying projected features that are in the linearly independent but this is sensitive. Where a sensitive attribute will not create Simpson's paradoxes. Oh, okay. So um, now uh, I would like to thank all of my colleagues who led to this work, and now I would like to I can open it for questions.